Okay, hello, this is Mr. Weber, and you are watching video lecture number 56, uh, titled Business Gets Bigger. Our subsections today uh, are the rise of the corporation, a national consumer culture, the corporate workplace, and on the shop floor. So late 19th century America underwent a remarkable economic transformation. Uh, many manufacturers still worked agricultural products into consumer goods, uh, footwear, textiles, furniture, paper, and the like, uh, to be purchased by individuals. But other manufacturers, increasingly important, uh, produced iron and steel and related equipment. Uh, locomotives, rolling stock, uh, and rails for railroads, machinery for factories, mines and oil fields, uh, and various forms for, constru for construction. These capital goods purchased by businesses added to the economic growth. By century's end, the United States stood as the world's ranking industrial nation. Steel and railroads defined this new economic order. Uh, the former were essential to a broad range of private enterprises and public undertakings. Uh, the latter were crucial to cheap, reliable overland transportation and the creation of a national economy. In the process of developing an integrated national economy, uh, railroads standardized both track gauge width uh, and time, uh, dividing the nation into four time zones. Economic growth brought with it declining prices, increasing real incomes, and widening economic inequality. Uh, the period also witnessed recurring economic depressions, especially those of 1873 and 1893, uh, and social conflict arose out of hard times and labor management confrontations. Free labor ideology, which extolled the ability of men to rise from being wage-earning laborers to craftsmen or land-owning farmers, was important to the early Republican Party. The passage of the Morrill Act uh, was a good example of this philosophy turned into law, uh, which had a profound and lasting effect on American education and life. However, from mid-century on, the world of work was becoming increasingly stratified. Entrepreneurs did indeed employ wage earners, but relatively few of these laborers would become independent farmers or craftsmen. In addition to men, children and women were employed in the new mines and in the new factories. Indeed, women were an important element in the growing labor force. In 1900, they constituted about 25% of all workers, with about one-third each in industry, domestic service, and some white-collar fields. Before the end of the 19th century, few married white women, uh, but a considerable number of married African-American women, uh, worked outside the home. However, as northern industrial states began to prohibit child labor and limit the working hours of adolescents, uh, thereby reducing the incomes of working-class families, more married women felt the need to take jobs outside the home. All right, so let's have a closer look then at business getting bigger with our first subsection, the rise of the corporation. The United States became an industrial power, largely by tapping the vast natural resources of North America, including minerals, lumber, and other raw materials in the West. This transition had great environmental significance. Uh, as steam and electricity became the chief energy workhorses, uh, industries that had once depended on water power began to use a prodigious amount of coal. Kerosene replaced whale oil and wood to produce both light and heat. By 1900, America's factories and urban homes were converting to electric power. Power produced from coal and oil had largely replaced the labor of water, animals, and people. Uh, cattle buyer Gustavus Swift pioneered the creation of a new kind of enterprise, a vertically integrated firm capable of handling within its own structure all the functions of an industry, from central processing all the way to distribution. He also utilized predatory pricing to absorb his competitors and gain greater market control. Others shared Swift's insight that the essential step 
uh, was to identify a mass market uh, and then develop a national enterprise capable of serving it. John D. Rockefeller's Standard Oil Company pioneered the concept of horizontal integration to create a national distribution system for oil. In 1882, Rockefeller's lawyers created a new legal form, the trust, uh, enabling Rockefeller to manage a number of different firms as a single entity. Trusts helped corporations increasingly concentrate ownership of business. By 1900, America's largest 100 companies controlled one-third of the nation's productive capacity. So let's move on and look at a national consumer culture. The retail business went through comparable changes. Uh, Montgomery Ward and Sears Roebuck uh, developed into national mail order houses for rural customers. Uh, John Wanamaker pioneered the department store and chain stores such as A&P and Woolworths were created. In the late 19th century, modern advertising appeared as big, 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 excuse me, big businesses set about the task of creating a national demand for their brand names. By 1900, companies spent over $90 million a year on advertising space in newspapers and magazines, making the press into a mass market industry. Millions of Americans, however, could not afford the luxuries advertised in magazines because of the series of economic recessions that plagued the nation during the late 19th century. So let's go to the next section then, which is the corporate workplace. Before the Civil War, most American boys had hoped to become farmers, small businessmen, or independent craft workers. Afterward, Americans gradually became accustomed to working for someone else. This change affected not only wage earners, but also managers, salesmen, and engineers. Because they wore white shirts with starched collars, such professionals became known as white-collar workers, a term that differentiated them from blue-collar workers on the shop floor. The shift had profound and wide-ranging consequences. Between the 1850s and the 1870s, railroad companies blazed the trail in inventing complex new systems of business control. With few exceptions, uh, the large vertically integrated firms of the post-Civil War years drew on the railroad model. The headquarters of major corporations began to house executives and an array of departments handling specific activities such as purchasing, accounting, and auditing. These departments were supervised by middle managers, something not seen before in American industry. Now, beneath the ranks of managers, another class of employees emerged, female office workers. Before the Civil War, most clerks at small firms had been young men, uh, just starting out, who expected to rise up through the ranks in their companies. Uh, in a large corporation, secretarial work became a dead-end job, and employers began to assign it to women. By the turn of the century, 77% of all stenographers and typists were female. By 1920, women held half of all low-level office jobs. For white working-class women, clerking and office work represented new opportunities. In an era before daycare, married women most often worked at home, where they could tend children while also taking in laundry, borders, or piecework, which is uh, sewing projects that were paid on a per-item basis. About a third of women worked in domestic service, uh, another third in industry, and the rest in office work, teaching, nursing, and sales. As new opportunities arose, uh, the percentage of wage-earning women who worked in domestic service dropped dramatically, a trend that continued into the 20th century. So let's move on to the next section on the shop floor. Despite the managerial revolution at the top, skilled craft workers, almost all of them men, uh, retained considerable autonomy in many industries. As, techno as uh, technology advanced, uh, however, workers increasingly lost the proud independence characteristic of craft work. Uh, the most important cause of this was the de-skilling of labor, 
uh, under a new system of mechanized manufacturing that Henry Ford would soon call mass production. By the early 20th century, managers came to believe that they could further reduce costs by getting employees to work harder and more efficiently. Uh, the pioneer in this field was Frederick W. Taylor, uh, an expert on metal cutting methods who dubbed his strategy scientific management. In its most extreme form, scientific management called for engineers to time each task with a stopwatch. Companies would then pay workers more if they met this stopwatch standard. Taylor assumed that only money mattered to workers and that they would respond automatically to the lure of higher earnings. As production was de-skilled, uh, the ranks of factory workers came to include more and more women and children, uh, who were almost always unskilled and paid lower wages. Women's presence was often resented by men. Uh, by the early 20th century, male labor unions also became outspoken leaders in the fight against child labor. Uh, by 1900, one in every five children under the age of 16 worked outside the home. Also at the bottom of the pay scale were most African American workers. Uh, because of racial discrimination, they were turned away from most corporate and industrial jobs. Such discrimination was hardly limited to the South. African American women who moved to northern cities found that there also, uh, they were largely excluded from office work and other new employment options. Uh, instead, they remained heavily concentrated in domestic service, uh, with over half employed in the field in the late 19th century. African American men confronted the same exclusion. America's booming, uh, vertically integrated corporations turned away black men from all but the most menial jobs. In 1890, almost a third of African American men worked in personal service. Employers in the North and West then recruited instead a different kind of low wage labor, immigrants. Okay, this does conclude today's video lecture. Uh, at this time, go ahead and answer the review questions at the bottom of the screen and continue on with your work.